at this time, we look back an event in recent history through the eyes of those who were there at the time. This week's I Was There is a bit different for me because I actually was there for this one. It was 36 years ago. I was on a holiday about five miles around the coast from here, a place called Port Island Bay. I was with my, uh, I think my my mum was there and my brother, and it was mid-afternoon. We were in this little chalet looking out to the sea, and I saw this boat, a passenger boat of some kind, come past the bay and then look as though it was going far too close to the rocks. Indeed, it had. The, The thing was called the Prince Ivanhoe. It was a steamer that left Mumbles Pier, just where we are now, on a pleasure cruise around the Gower Peninsula. In short, it got too close to the coast, hit the rocks and then beached. It was in real danger of sinking, more than 400 passengers on board. Terry Sylvester was the manager of the charity which ran the Prince Ivanhoe and indeed its replacement, the Balmoral, which runs to this day. Um, Terry, what, what do you remember of the, of the Prince Ivanhoe and, 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 and of that day? Well, Prince, in remembering Prince Ivanhoe in general, of course, was that we bought Prince Ivanhoe to be a support ship to the famous paddle steamer Waverley, uh, to share the fixed costs of the offices, the marketing, uh, to train up officers, and to get piers reopened or kept open around Britain. Uh, and of course, that's why the Balmoral sails today for the same purpose to keep the paddle steamer of it financially viable. And where did this paddle steamer come from? It's a Prince Ivanhoe. Well, you, you bought it, did you, from somebody? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, Prince Ivanhoe wasn't a paddle steamer, to keep the record straight. Okay. She was a twin-screw motor ship, uh, okay. and she was built for the, uh, by Denny's of Dumbarton, the famous Clyde ship builders, uh, to sail for British Railways, or the Southern Railway originally, to the Isle of Wight uh, uh, from Portsmouth. Uh, So she acted as both ferry and cruise ship uh, in the Isle of Wight with two other ships as well. And when the Prince Ivanhoe, uh, which was originally named Shanklin, became surplus to requirements, we heard about her, found out what a beautiful passenger ship she was, raced off to Portsmouth, uh, found that a Chinese restaurant had already put in an offer to buy her, but uh, the British Rail representative said, uh, if you can come up with the money by Wednesday, they haven't paid yet, you can have it. Uh, so we did, uh, and uh, he came to Barry to our family business office, where I work from, uh, and handed over the documents, and I handed him over the cheque. Uh, and after that, of course, all the effort to put her back into service uh, and operate her, uh, principally on the Bristol Channel to carry on the great tradition of P&A Campbell's White Funnel Fleet. Uh, all looked to be going wonderfully well, and as we say, on that very day when she was lost, uh, there were over 800 passengers joined her from Panas Pier, from Minot Harbour, and from the Mumbles. So it was very sad that it happened. So, so what did I actually see happening through my young eyes? I just saw it get too close to the rocks. Why did it come too close to what we know as Port Island Point on the the western edge of Port Island Bay? Well, I don't think it's ever been proved as to what the Prince Ivanhoe struck. Uh, It was considered by some that that, uh, she ran over the boiler of a ship that had been sunk in the Second World War, and that the position of the boiler had shifted in gales. Um, uh, pleasure steamers sail close to the coast constantly and into piers and ports, uh, so I think it, it's historically questionable whether she ran over rocks. Uh, the but she was too close. Uh, No, because sailing close uh, is perfectly normal with pleasure steamers uh, to give people wonderful views. Uh, You need need, uh, uh, obviously to understand uh, what's underneath you uh, and to navigate correctly. And she was in command uh, of Captain David Neal, but uh, they're very experienced. But David wasn't on the bridge. He was working with a Department of Trade surveyor. Okay. Let's just hear from somebody who was on board, John Woodward. He got on earlier that day at Panath, I think you said it started out. He's been speaking to us, told us what happened after the ship left Mumbles Pier, where we are now. I had gone down to the saloon, the aft saloon, right at the very rear of the ship, to sit down and have a rest, because it had gone a bit chilly up on top. All of a sudden, there was this rumble from beneath the ship, a really loud rumble which got louder and louder and a silence for a moment and then a huge bang I went up on deck and one of the engineers came up from below covered in this oily water and said 
to the captain, it's finished. So you were in your office in Glasgow, Terry, when a journalist rang? Uh, no, I was in my office in Barry. In uh, Barry right. I, I live in Barry, where we run our family business for 125 years this year. Uh, and um, but I did chairman, managing director of the pleasure yeah. steamers since the beginning, since we took Waverley over. Uh, and uh, I received a, a call uh, from uh, the media asking if I'd come in for an interview uh, in Cardiff in the studio. And I said, uh, "Why is that?" And he said, "Oh, the Prince Ivanhoe is in trouble off the Gower coast." I said, well, I've got to stay by the telephone. Uh, and he said, you won't come for an interview and the Prince Ivanhoe's sinking. Uh, so uh, I swallowed hard and uh, they sent a crew down from Cardiff right. uh, to interview me there. Okay. So Brian Jeffrey is a not long retired lifeboat man of 55 years, 1981, full-time mechanic here at the Mumbles Pier lifeboat station. Now, this is, this is a big old sort of offshore lifeboat you've got here at Mumbles, yeah, isn't it? That's correct. Um, I wasn't full-time. I was uh, relieving at the time, right. as the full-time guy I was on leave. So I was acting station mechanic Yeah. when we had the shout to go to the Ivanhoe. And you'd already been out that day, hadn't you? Been out most of the night, towing a yacht in. Got in back into Mumbles about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, went for a few hours sleep. Came back down in the morning to submit sure the boat was all right, ready for sea again. Went home lunchtime for something to eat, and the phone went, and the coxswain was saying, get down here quick, the yeah, Ivanhoe's going to show. And didn't stop till very, very late at the night. So when you got there, you were confronted with the scene that the, the, that I saw, that the Ivanhoe had <coughs> hit the rocks, and then the it, was, it was beached, and it was at low tide, wasn't That's it? That's right. The bow of the boat was a, up the beach, which was a great thing, uh, and there was people going ashore. And it always struck me, as you always see on the television of D-Day landings, it was, the, or the, you know, that type of thing with hundreds of people on the beach and little boats ferrying ashore, uh, the survivors, really. We tied up alongside and did what we had to do or what we could do. And as we were on the boat, the boat was sinking, of course. The tide was going out and the boat was settling. And the... Th thankfully the engineer on board managed by some miracle to get the engine restarted it was the oh, captain yeah. it was the captain who'd, who'd came over the loudspeaker to say they'd be making a run for the beach after they hit the rock so we're going back a bit here but here's John Woodward recalling that the captain announced that the ship had struck an underwater obstruction and we had to put life belts on and, and the ship was going to be beached so that they could get us all off. And we had the seven blasts on the whistle, which is the emergency signal. And, and we um, made our way with the filthy fumes coming out of the funnel because they said the ship was running mainly on seawater. We um, went astern and come round towards the beach to beach the ship on the sand. Quite amazing for the people on the beach to be seeing this ship coming at them. And um, we ended up having to get our feet wet uh, when we got off the ship and we were rather taken aback by sitting on the beach thinking we were on our ship all sailing along and now we're shipwrecked. Teddy, we should point out that one poor man did lose his life on the beach. I think he had a heart attack there, didn't he? Uh, yes, that was Mr Holyoke, uh, the father of John Holyoke. John, a great supporter of the operation of Waverley and Balmoral and Ivanhoe. And John always said that he didn't consider this was caused by the, 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 the loss of Ivanhoe. His father had a bad heart, uh, um, but uh, obviously very sad. But... Uh, John never held that uh, against the incident because he believed his father's condition was such that it could happen at any time. Uh, Brian, it could have been an awful lot worse, couldn't it, if that uh, engine hadn't got restarted? Very much worse. <laughs> to go alongside a ship up on the rocks does, and the tide drop in is trying to get alongside it. But uh, go back to the man that died. Our lifeboat doctor went with him in the helicopter. Um, to do what he could try and do to revive him, but unfortunately he didn't. But other than that, it, uh, I don't think anybody got hurt. 
which was marvellous, really. Uh, Nicola Haywood thomas was working for BBC Wales today at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicola joins us now, one of the reporters who watched the scene. What, what, what do you remember of this, Nicola? I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. It probably doesn't to you either. Well, I did have to dredge a little bit in the memory, Adrian, but you say I was working as a reporter. I wasn't really. I was probably the last person left in the newsroom when um, the bus with the passengers were, was coming back to Banath. I was actually a very junior sub-editor on Wales Today. And what strikes me about this story is that it really points up the difference in technology. We'd had some fantastic footage that had been sent to us in the afternoon from a freelance cameraman in Swansea. But um, the communications, of course, we're back in the days of no mobile phones. These days, we'd have had people with mobile phone footage and um, a lot of more instant coverage. What I remember mainly is being dispatched as a very green young re trainee reporter, if you like, sent down to talk to the passengers who were returning by bus. They seemed remarkably calm, very unfazed, and I remember talking to Mr Holyoke about the sad loss of his father, and he was incredibly composed. Um, so I was actually not at the dramatic end of this story at all. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, Terry, the salvage operation for the boat went on for, for a number of years. It was kind of unfortunate a way that it, it had to beach at low tide, which meant a lot of it was sort of underwater for a lot of the time, which made the salvage operation very difficult. But it was a saga that went on for years, didn't it? Yes, I mean, that was completely out with our control no, because, of course. of course, the ship was abandoned to the underwriters because the, uh, uh, the level of insurance on the ship wouldn't... Uh, provide the funds to re to take her off and restore her which uh, could have been done in practical terms i'm sure but it was simply a financial matter and uh, a constructive total loss so uh, uh, really we didn't have anything to do with the, with the salvage uh, at all um, and had no control over it um, we did manage to rescue the uh, ship's uh, uh, hooter which was the uh, from the originally from the famous paddle steamer Glenusk, so it was a steam whistle and uh, that uh, was something that was uh, thought uh, we didn't want to lose but the rest of the ship of course um, as I say didn't ever come back to us and uh, was uh, abandoned and became under the control I think uh, uh, of the receiver of wrecks. Brian you actually got on board didn't you as the water was coming in? Yes we went aboard there and helped the crew get all the stuff together and actually we brought back about £20,000 worth of gear that night. We towed all the lifeboats and rafts back with our lifeboats, of course, moored them off the pier here till they were taken away eventually. Yeah. Um, so what yes. was the scene like on board? It, it, oh. there, was, there was water flowing through the, 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 the communal rooms there yeah. and so on. When we got aboard, um, or got, got, got outside it, most of the passengers had left then. But uh, the last of them were getting off then, so yeah, our job was sort of look after the crew and the the, um, the captain and his wife and little girl. Uh, they came back with us then to Mumbles. So, in the in the saloon bar there, you were up to your knees in up in to your knees water. in seawater. Graham Wright, a uh, friend of mine, one of the crew, we went down the after saloon, and as we went over the stairs, of course the water was in the up to our knees. Make sure everybody's up to there. And uh, he said, hey, look, the bar's open. And, of course, the guy pulled the shutters down. <laughs> Come all this way, and they close the bar. But so Nicola, something yeah. funny out of it, you yeah. always find, not being facetious, yeah, but yeah. you always find something. Uh, Nicola, I mean, you write about it being a different kind of environment completely. I mean, my dad had gone back to the West Midlands that day, leaving the rest of us there. And we didn't even have a telephone, let alone a mobile phone. We didn't have any kind of telephone, let him know what happened. He switched the news on that night, and, and there he was, the Prince Ivanhoe, in the middle of Port Island Bay, where he'd been for two weeks, but left that morning. See, it's bizarre, isn't it? It really is. And I think that when we look at the coverage of news stories, breaking news stories now, it is an entirely different world. We were working 
in Wales today in those days on film, not on, on any sort of tape. So our camera crews were working on good old-fashioned 16 mil film, which would have to be driven back to Cardiff, would have to go through the processing. And, and then, of course, everything was so much more last minute. There was no sense of, of real immediacy in television terms in those days. And that really showed that day, I think, because we were not at all clear in the newsroom uh, here at BBC Wales what was happening. It was a big story. Our news editor at the time was a huge fan of the paddle steamers and the Prince Ivanhoe. And so it was a major, major story for him. He loved any sort of boats and um, and stories about um, boats or planes, actually. So, I mean, we were we were... We were obviously trying to cover the story as best we could. We got yeah. some pictures onto the news, and then it was really getting the information in a much slower way than today's yeah. news audiences are used to. Okay. Uh, and tell me briefly, the, the sister ship, is the sister ship, is that accurate to say the Balmoral is still going strong? Uh, uh, yes, uh, um, uh, not uh, precisely a sister ship, because, uh, you know, sister ships were uh, described as that when they were identical. Okay. Uh, but uh, Balmoral is still very much going strong. <laughs> she's just done a spring program in the Bristol Channel. She's now off to London and the Solent, and then back on the Bristol Channel for July and August. And uh, Waverley will be back down here in August as well. Waverley is sailing in Scotland uh, today. Okay. Uh, and and will continue to again the Solent and the Thames later in the year. The, yeah. It's an interesting uh, yeah. point, we'll say, perhaps, of people's reaction, is that I wondered, you see, after the great coverage of this yeah. event, w yeah. would people stay away? The Waverley sailed the following morning, That's on the good, Tuesday yeah. morning. That's good. That's, I'm glad to hear it. With the highest number okay. of the season. Thank you very much indeed. Terry Sylvester, thanks to Brian Jeffrey, thanks to Nicola Haywood-Thomas, thanks to Mumbles Pier. Afternoon edition is next. <laughs>